Hello, hello, and welcome to Lawrence Plays. So, last week I managed to complete Factorio Space Exploration 0.5, and when I say complete, I mean that I managed to get to the spaceship victory, which is the one where you fly a spaceship very fast for a long for a long period of time, and then you get a, and then you get a big congratulations and you win. Um, I didn't I haven't actually managed to get on to the um, the archaeological victory, but I've decided that I'm going to move over to playing 0.6 and with Crastorio 2 from um, next week. So this seemed like a good point to finish this run, and so because of that, I'm going to give you a sort of a bit of a summary, a bit of a sort of a run through of what I've done during the game, and and sort of how I felt about it as well. Um, so let's start off by going back to the very very beginning down here on Norvis, where we have your traditional start, you know, where you get all of the little little ore patches, you mine them up and then and smelt them on site, and then you run out of the ore, but then the ore patches run out, so you start bringing the ore in by train, and then you realise the smelting array isn't fast enough, so you build a smelting array somewhere else and then bring all of the iron, all of the plates in by train. So that's what I've done here. Got the resources coming in here, and then we've got the sort of the initial bus I built, where you know you start off with the basic stuff like yellow belts and drills and assembly machines and so on and science and then you carry on you, you build your bus up you get you, you start doing the research here you make another science pack red circuits and green circuits get built on the bus and, and you keep going and you keep going and you keep going and eventually you get to the point where you go well actually I need to start taking stuff off my bus because I can't do it quickly enough so as I said the um, the ore the ore refining went over to here so I had this this was my uh, second generation um, ore, uh, ore smelting facility and I'm actually a bit surprised to see it in use that's not really supposed to happen it's not supposed to be used anymore um, but it seems to be in fairly heavy use. Okay, so the the, the factory is all falling apart a bit. But it's lucky. So it's luckily, I, luckily, I finished the, <laughs> finished the game. Um, <clears throat> then I then I went on and moved off the green circuit production. So that's all going on over here. You you can tell this was a very long time ago because it's all using yellow belts and tier two assembly machines. Did the same with red red circuit production. So that's over here. Um, but this one I came in and upgraded. So I've actually put in modules and beacons here um, and upgraded all of the belts. So we use, we're producing the red. Well, we we would be producing the red circuits a bit more quickly if we had enough plastic. But we seem to run out of plastic. So um, yeah, that's that's all stalled as well. Blue circuits and were the next thing to be moved off as well. Unlike my Angel Bob's run, I, I never got round to moving the the basic science packs off the bus. So those are actually still being made down here. This this factory down here with all these yellow belts and all this sort of miscellaneous yellow inserters and everything is still making the red science for my um, for my for my science facilities. And it is more or less keeping up as you can see by this. There's a backlog that only goes back to here. So it is go it is yeah going quite well. Let's have some light. There we go. That's a bit better. So yeah, it's made it here. So it, it, it is still still keeping up, which is quite an impressive. Um, it shows how little science you get through in this game. But this, the complexity comes not from producing massive massive quantities of all the science packs, but from the complexity in actually building the science packs themselves. But yeah, so that then I was able to start bringing in the the various different types of circuits here and a few other ingredients as well. So the, this the bad the bus carried on being sort of being there to produce all of the infrastructure requirements. So for example, I'm building all of the inserters, here, all the different types of inserters here. I'm building um, ammunition here, science again, and once again, different types of belts here, and so on, all the way up, roboports and robots and so on. And then eventually, eventually I got up to all the space stuff and I was able to start um, building building rocket parts on mass. Um, and then eventually getting around to do, do, starting to launch rockets. And so that enabled me to go out and start discovering the solar system. And in space exploration, you get you get you, you start off on Norvis, and then eventually you'll take off from Norvis, you'll go up to Norvis orbit, and you can and you can start doing stuff on a little space station there. And you grow that space and grow it and grow it. And as you do more and more rocket launches, you discover you discover various planets around the Kali in the Kalidas system. So you've got the Kalidas Sun, and you've got various planets out here. So you've got Miokin, Norvis, Sakimi, Karura, and so on, all the way out here. And they have various different moons. And if we look at this menu here, you can see that they, it tells you in here what type of resources you can get from those moons or, or planets. So Norvis is a general miscellaneous planet. Miokin is a vulcanite planet. Greenleaf is a coal planet. Tulip is a vitamilange planet, and so on. So you've got all these exotic resources to go off after and so I am um, I, I carried on expanding I went off to uh, I went off to frost this is probably one of my earlier um, er earlier places I went to although I have done a bit of modernization up here since then so I, I, I put in a, um, a beryllium mine up here and a cryonite mine up here and owned a coal mine as well apparently fed fed the um, the resources down from all of those into my base here and then I was able to refine that down and over here oh yeah over here we're processing the um, the beryllium into the it's sort of the barrel into beryllium. So we've got the barrel ore coming in here, and the beryllium then goes out. It goes down here now, but it used to come out this way into into the middle through through the base. And then we're building the um, 
make well, then I started building this delivery cannon capsules which are these things and you can put those into a delivery cannon with in this case a load of um, a ber beryllium um, or alternatively up here with a load of ice that you've made from cry using cryonite to freeze water and you can fire that off to other planets <clears throat> and that allows you to get resources from here to to other places perhaps to my um, perhaps to my space station or to other planets that need those they need those particular resources but then the basic the, the, the needs of the base expanded a bit so I ended up making a significantly larger um, beryllium processing facility now this is this is not using um, modules because I, I don't really know why I think it's just I wasn't really hadn't really got into the habit of using modules at this stage so uh, this was a bit earlier this is um, this is a rather poor design now well I'm, I'm using the modules sorry but I'm not using beacons that's what I meant to, meant to say beacon I'm not, not beaconing it as much as I should um, but this is eventually going to is, is making decent quantities of beryllium uh, which can then be fed into a rocket and now and, and now the next step was to start using rockets there's one going now we'll take some um, cryonite off to I don't know where it's taking it, but it's definitely taking some cryonite because uh, it's being loaded in there. Um, and the rocket is leaving. So yeah, this is what this is a part of the uh, the, spa the space part of um, space exploration. So again, down here I've got something very similar. I'm bringing in um, cryonite uh, ore, whatever the cryonite. Ore, what is the cryonite ore called? Oh, simply called cryonite. Oh, and then you you do, you uh, process and process and process it into cryonite, and you eventually have cryonite rods specifically. Then those are the ones that go out and get fed onto the rocket into the rocket to be taken away. So that's the sort of, that was the next stage of my uh, of my development. After the um, after having the uh, the delivery cannons, I moved on to, to, to using rockets to transport stuff around. And then after that, I decided that well, rockets are all very well, but there's more exciting stuff around. And if I go out and have a look on Kothar, then I can see that potentially, yeah, we, we, we get, well, there's a rocket there that's taking the glass away from this planet. But over here, we've got a facility, we've got landing pads here, and these are landing pads for spaceships. And if we go over and have a look at Norvis Orbit, which I've been talking about a little bit, we can see that, um, where am I, where, where's that spaceship, where's that spaceship touched down? Here it is. So this spaceship is, is bringing up Iridium from, from Kothar, and then that gets unloaded onto the belt here, and it puts it onto the train system. So when I first got to Norvis Orbit, I built out a sort of a bus space system with, with a rocket coming up that was dropping supplies off in a rocket landing pad that was, it was in here, and that was getting put into these chests, and then bots were distributing it into a row of requester chests, and putting it onto a bus, and I was building all of the first, built all of the first tiers of science off that. Then when I got onto the second tier of space science, I decided that wasn't good enough, so I built out this system here, which has a massive series of um, rocket landing pads, uh, each of which requests its own own specific resource. So we've got coal here, we've got ice, we've got uh, cryonite rods, we've got beryllium, and so on, all the way around. All, all of these, lots of different resources, and then they get picked up by trains that come in, trundle in here, they'll stop at one of these stations, like this one has with the plastic over here. It'll grab some and it'll take it off to wherever it's requ required. <coughs> So I'll get on to talking about how I did the science in a little while. But first, having having mentioned spaceships, I thought it's it's quite interesting to see the the uh, development and growth of spaceships. So my first generation spaceships were actually even smaller than this one. So they didn't have the, they didn't use ion engines on the back. They used rocket engines, and they had probably a couple of these tanks in them. And they didn't need anything like as many solar panels. So they were probably about half the length, maybe a little bit more than half the length. So you have a stubby front on the on the front to give it a little bit of streamlining, some lasers to defend it, but it doesn't go that fast. So you don't need much in the way of lasers. You have a big warehouse that you can put all you can put 500 stacks of um, whatever the material is you're bringing in, and a little bit of, and a little bit of circuitry for automation. Now some people like to put some of the circuitry outside the ship. I I've always put it inside because it, it fits better with my sort of it feels right to have the ship carrying around its logic and that tells it where to go and what to do um, <clears throat> maybe next time I'll look at I'll think about putting it outside but for now there's always been room to put it inside even if sometimes it's a little bit tapped, uh, crowded and cramped and if you want to know more about how this works you can go off and watch the uh, the video that tells you all about um, automating spaceships that's, that's a good one to watch so then this is probably a second generation spaceship. It's got it, it, it's up, been upgraded to a, uh, to a to to an ion engine which is provides a lot more thrust, a lot more power from a much smaller amount of from a, and the fuel goes a lot further. So but you still need to have the booster tanks in order to take off with the rocket booster tanks that is in order to take off from planets. The um the, with ion engines you can't take off from planets. So it helped a little bit but only a bit. And then the upgrades continued. I made then I made a bigger ship. This is my, this was a personal ship. I'm still using this one actually. This is one for flying around in the solar system. So it's got three ion engines on the back, so it goes a bit faster because I'm impatient. Um, and it's got a, a warehouse at the front here that you can just chuck stuff into. And I and I can look in here when and there's a fairly high chance that if I need something, I've probably chucked some of it in there at some point or another. 
Then I got onto the next sort of next generation ship. So this one is not designed to land on planets, but it's got more ion engines because it's designed to go a lot further. This one's designed to go interstellar, so much, much further distances. So I wanted it to be a lot faster. Um, and it's got the next generation of, um, of, of, of heap of power generation on it as well. So here on the older ones, we had solar panels because they just fly around in the solar system. It's fine. You've got loads of power generation from those. These ones leave the solar system, and once you're outside, there's very, very little sunlight, so you, so solar panels are more or less useless. So instead, this uses beam power, and I've got some massive beam generators in orbit around Kalidus, the sun, um, that beam out power to these things, and they can pick that up. They get, they get heated up. As you can see, this is still at 9,000 degrees centigrade. And you can then use that to boil water, generate power, and that powers the, um, the shield generators, the shield generators at the front, the lasers, and the ion engines. And then there have been a few more ships since then. And there's ones like this one that carry trains. So um, these, these these go out to um, various different planets, pick up core fragments in the trains, and then bring them back up, back to Norvis to be processed. And that's quite, that works quite nicely. There's a habit. The it seems to have a bit of a habit of sometimes cutting the trains in half, which is a little bit upsetting. But it's quite. But it's, I did this because it's very very quick to load and unload the ships. Um, compared to these, which which unload load and unload down down belts, which is much much slower. The trains can shoot out and shoot back in again far more quickly. But the downside is. They're not very dense. They're not very storage dense. Each of the, the each of these ships actually has less storage capacity than one of these ships. This single warehouse carries more than all ten of these uh, wagons put together. So it's it, it, it's it's a nice idea. It works quite well, but it's not as great as you might think. On a similar note, I did not um, that, that ship's missing, but there's another one that lands in here that has two different trains with different different things on them. So it carries f about four or five different types of resource, and then comes around here to these stations and, and, and unloads them through, through, the, through these belt systems for other trains again then to come along and pick up from here. There are a few, a couple more ships that are worth, uh, a few more ships that are worth mentioning actually. Uh, let's see, there's. This one down here is a is a fuel tanker. So this one flies down to um, an oily planet, picks up large quantities of oil, flies back up here with it to um to feed these to feed the feed the uh, the oil processing systems I've got up here. And on a similar note, I've got one that goes to the same planet that would be in here, but I, but it seems to be off off being busy at the moment. Here it is. So this one goes off to pick up large quantities of rocket fuel, which it will then fly back out to Norvis orbit, so I can refuel all my ships. Then I've got uh, I've got these ones which carry a different resource, and these these are slightly bigger because it's a very very chunky resource. So I wanted a little bit more space for that. And the other part of that one, the, that's the uh, the um, Naquium. The other part of that is these really these long range interstellar ships that carry huge amounts of the uh, of, of uh, the crushed Naquitite to be made into Naquium, um, and they do a really long journey out from a distant asteroid field with with this stuff in order to bring it back to the space station to be processed down and 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 produced and to turned into what I want. And here you can see the um, the the beam receiver and all of its associated stuff in action. We put, and this we can produce an enormous amount of power from this system, so it's really it works really well for this sort of thing. I've also made a couple of late game ships. Down here we've got one that I've named the Jellyfish because it kind of looks like one, especially when it's um, when it's in, when it's in flight. Um, and this is it's, it's, I, I, I like the shape of it. I find it quite pleasing. It's a sort of a nice a nice blob shape with the engines across the back in in a sort of a V shape, and then the uh, the power in the middle. And this is a, one of those ships that was designed kind of the, the the form fits the function to an extent in that I needed to make the um, the power generation more or less this shape. And I needed to, and I wanted to have a row of engines on the back of it, and then the rest of it I just sort of crammed in around that wherever there was space to do so. And so it, it yeah, it's come together quite nicely, and this one's come together quite pleasingly. I like this one. Speaking of um, endgame ships, um, there was then finally this this one was my um, my victory ship. This is the one that went out to do a speed of 250 for 10 minutes out into the wild black yonder. Um, in order to in order to get the victory because that is the victory condition and it took quite a bit of fiddling and the reason this one is sort of a little bit blocky and a little bit chunky chunky um, is because I needed this massive power generation block in the middle I needed all of these engines to go fast to go at the speed required and so then the rest of the ship was sort of built around that and didn't have mu I didn't have much room for going out and being sort of playful and artistic because I was right up against the limit of um, the, uh, of the hull integrity, so you can see 37, 39, 79 out of 4,000 is pretty close. That's why it's got all these holes in it as well to to, to give it a bit more, uh, a little bit more oomph. So yes, that's spaceships, and there's been lots of that. the spaceships have been one of my favourite parts of this game, I think, because there's so much you can do with them. Because they're all they're also programmable. You can come up with all kinds of clever things you want them to do, um, and program them to, to where where and when to go and what to do. And they're just fun to build and put together as well. So that, that was yeah, I enjoyed that. Thank you.
Oh, this is another one. This is this is my uh, umbrella defense ship. So it's got an umbrella defense there. But, so the idea is you can protect against coronal mass ejection with the ship by just flying out to somewhere where one's going to happen. And then again, we've got plenty of power here, and that should just power the uh, the umbrella defense. Now, the one time I tried it, it didn't actually work. So I don't know what went wrong there, but we shall have to. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll 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 see. Maybe we'll make a new one in the new game and see if it works there. So that's my that was the beginning. That's the, the spaceships. That's my logistics systems are all covered now. So we we started off with the delivery cannon. Well, we started off with belts on Norvis and trains, I suppose. Then we moved up. When then when we when we moved to space, we had rockets to take us places and delivery cannons to send resources around. Then I upgraded to using rockets to send resources around. Then upgraded to using spaceships to send to move resources around. And to an extent, I've left the rocket, all the rocket stuff in here, and I know some a lot of people don't, but I've left this in here because it basically it works well. I'd set up all the infrastructure for it, so why not just leave it there? I've not put in any really put in any new rocket routes. Anything that was need, need would need to be done new, I was doing with spaceships, but the rockets were fine where they where they already existed. The main downside of rockets, to be fair, fair is that you have to um, you have basically you have to supply fuel on the uh, on the on the um, other planet wherever you're bringing stuff from. You can you can send out the parts for the rocket relatively easily, but the fuel tends to be so big you need to make it in, in situ. So that requires a certain amount of extra uh, infrastructure around it. So my space station. I decided that a good design for the space station would be to have a railway line running down the middle of it as a sort of a, a spine essentially, and then break off have have these islands off it. I mean, they're almost like towns from a traditional Factorio playthrough, but the, the, each of these sort of town areas is doing one particular type of science. So we've got energy science up here, we've got astro science, we've got material science, biological science, deep space science, and then we've got a couple of extra sort of random bits. So we've got rocket science here, we've got um, the actual doing of the science here, and then we've got one here for launching off probes, and then a little bit over here for generating antimatter. So each, as far as I need to, I can, I can basically extend these things out as many as many as, as much as I want, and I left a I left a decent chunk of space between them, as you can see, and it has so far been sufficient. None of these prongs that are sticking out from these have, have um, really intruded on the next area. Although this one's kind of close, and if this if I did put another rail in down here, this one would be a bit close as well. But it has worked out, and if, if necessary, you can always loop things round like I've done here. So um, this is because I thought this was going to stick out a bit too far. I brought it round and brought it back in on the other side. So you, you could, there's, there's always ways of working around these things. And so each one of these science areas, we have various stations that will bring in all the resources. And each of these, are, they're all using LTN, and each one of these will, will request six different resources. So we've got stone, data cards, copper, iron, mirrors, and green circuits being brought in here. Uh, trains come in with those. They get unloaded into the appropriate uh, chests and then unloaded into the, into the system. So, so it keeps everything running merrily. Um, there's a couple of there are a few improvements I would like to make to this system, and I talked about them in the L advanced LTN trains tutorial. So if you want to, so I don't, again that's another one to go off and watch, <laughs> another good video to check out. So we, we could then then have another unloading system over here, and then we're turning the, the um, ingots into plates because you need to do that at some point. And then we've just got the standard main bus type layout here, but only with the ingredients and resources that are required for this particular science pack. So that makes it a lot smaller and a lot more compact. And then we can start making the data cards. And in space exploration, each each um, science pack, each of the advanced space science packs at least, are made out of four data cards. So here, for example, we are making lightning data, which is conductivity data. Then here we're making radiation data, yes. And then we're making polarization data. And then we had to make some, and then we had to make plasma in order to make ion stream in order to make the final one, which is electromagnetic field data. Then you put all four of those together in a um, in a supercomputer, and you can feed out these catalogs, and we'll get back onto back onto those later. And the nice thing about space exploration is each of the four different types of space science has its own feel. So energy science, you're doing a lot of sort of energy heavy stuff. You're building, you're you're doing particle, you're creating um, plasma streams and particle, you're using particle accelerators. There's a lot of very energy hungry hungry things in here, and there's a certain amount of reuse of data cards as well. So you'll see that up here, we're taking off some of these um, polarized magnetic whatever these data cards are, we're taking some of them off further up to be used for a different science pack. And some of them are being used here as well for the um, what I've been calling um, uh, London Eye data, because it kind of looks like it. Um, so you've got you've got that sort of challenge with this one, and then if we, as we as we look at the other sciences, I'll talk about those a bit as well. And then so you bring up the data cards from all of that, you can start making the tier two catalogs. Um, then you make more data cards, more data cards, more data cards, and you make the tier three catalogs, and eventually you get all the way up to the tier four catalogs, which is the top, with the top one of each side. And so all of those I'm then putting out into, into these stations, and that means they're then ready to be taken away by a train when 
when they're required somewhere else. And also some of the other things that we're making around here as sort of side products are being taken away as well. So then we have the um, astronomic data down here. And this is the feel of this one. This one's very, the challenge in this one was largely down to sort of throughput of these, um, of these um, what are these things even called? Uh, observation frames. So making enough of these and cramming them, getting them all through all of the systems that require them was a, was, a, was a challenging part of this, I found. But then here you're doing all kinds of telescope activities. So you're taking the observation frames and we're uh, we're looking through a normal telescope to make an infrared observation frame, to make a, a visible one and to make presumably an ultraviolet one, yes. And then you use radio telescopes and, um, and x-ray telescopes and so on to make all kinds of different um, different versions of the observation frames that can then be fed into these orreries to turn into data and once again the data all gets put passed down into the um, into the science machines down into these supercomputers down here where we make tier one and tier two um, astronomic data and then you have similar things more telescopes more orreries um, to make and what's going, what's going on down here here we're making negative pressure data and apparently that is actually a thing um, and dark matter data and that goes into tier three and then tier four, you've got similar sort of things. So what are we doing here? We are making dark energy, zero point energy, and micro black hole data. Plus, um, plus also sending out spaceships to explore probes to explore um, rock, uh, asteroid fields. And we're, so we're getting this data from them. Um, and that all gets fed into here. And again, in exactly the same way, we're making, making all these catalogs. Next up, this material science. Similar ways, you, you'll make, you make enormous quantities of these uh, material data pa material testing packs. Is that what they're called? Yeah, material testing packs. I, I'm apparently not making enough of these because I've ramped up the science production fairly recently. That's um, interesting. So those all flow down here. They go, they go through, and we make, and they get abused in various different ways. So maybe we freeze them, or we burn them, or we crush them. No, stretch them, or we crush them. Um, or we and that makes that makes science pack what the catalog one or you test the rigidity of the um, of the of these b uh, beams we're making or you crash trains into them we do all kinds of weird things shoot them maybe all kinds of stuff like that and this makes and this makes the the various types of data for the for the materials uh, uh, science so these the, down here we've got tier two catalogs and it's more of the same sort of thing irradiate things tier three um, and and so on and so on and eventually you get tier four down here as well. Um, so the, the challenge of the material science was is a bit different to the other ones. The ch main challenge here is that a lot of these produce scrap in extreme quantities. So take this one for example, the um, the impact shielding data. To make this make one of this one, you're basically making a g heavy girder and you're crashing a, tr a locomotive into it, which is well, it's kind of ludicrous, but that's what you do. And this then produces. Um, okay, it produces quite a lot of, um, it produces 25 data, but it also produces 1500 scrap, and that all gets dumped out onto the uh, onto the belt here, and then goes down here, and this, this is currently a little bit of a problem, we have too much more scrap than we know what to do with, but it all gets fed through here into this, into this station, where we can put it onto trains, the trains will take it away to the recycling facility and deal with that. So the challenge of the material science is dealing with the enormous quantities of scrap. Finally, for the uh, sort of the, the main tier of space sciences, you've got biological science, and this is sort of this is making genetic data and, and, and goo and splooging them together, and again burning and freezing and smashing and splashing and all that sort of stuff. And the challenge here was sort of is in keeping your is in the loops of the, all the various different liquids you have to keep going around. So as well as the coolants, you've also got to have all, all these various different types of biological goo being fed up and down, and some of them are. Sometimes the goos are produced, sometimes they're used up. And so the challenge here is to keep everything in balance. And again, you've got the supercomputers producing tier one, tier two, tier three, and tier four biological data. And that all gets passed off into the stations as well. Once you've got all this data in your stations, you can then send it off up here to the uh, to the processing facilities, and up here we've got. Um, let's let's look have a look at this one. This is astronomic data. You can tell by the blue colour. So once again, we've got. Um, here we go. We've got, we've got a tra train trains coming into a station here, and they're dropping off the four different types of catalog. Although we seem to have run out of threes, um, and also some low density structures and some ber beryllium. And these are all fed over here. We turn the beryllium into plates, and then into armored plates, and into rods and aeroframe scaffolds and then each of these so to make tier one science it requires the basic ingredient plus some significant data plus the tier one catalogs and insights and i'll talk about insignificant data and insights in a moment and that'll make the tier one science pack so that's fairly easy tier two you then need the next version up of the um of that thing so this is beryllium that's been processed plus the other things plus tier two catalogs and also the uh science pack ones just to make things a little bit harder 
then for threes you need the uh, beryllium that's been processed twice and the tier three catalogs and the tier two science packs and then finally beryllium that's been processed three times you, see, you can see the you can see how the pattern works here and you make loads and loads of science packs out of this it all gets it all floods out into the system and you can and you can take it off and do science the extra complication is that you also need to make insights for the science packs and these take in one or more types of the um of the uh, catalogs and they will turn them into these little cylinder things that, that are called insights and those are used both for making science although we seem to have run out of those because we've run out of these catalogs and also the insights get taken up here where they go into supercomputers that will turn them into um, into the significant data the yellow cards that have been drift knocking around these ones but again this has stopped because we've run out of the uh, the blue insights so there's there's some problem a few problems in the factory here and there but the, the system mostly works <laughs> Quite cleverly though, the whole science system, the whole space science system is designed so that you can go either wide or deep. You can either go in there and do tier one of all four of the sciences, or you can start with say astro science and just take that all the way to tier four without having to touch the tier, um, uh, the, 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 uh, other, any of the other, other science packs to start with. Now you need to do them all eventually of course, but it's up to you to choose what order you want to do them in. And you, you probably base that largely on, um, well maybe a little bit on complexity, but also on um, which things you want to unlock. So if you're really pushing for spaceships you might concentrate on Astro, but if you wanted to, um, I don't know, if you wanted to get more powerful energy production systems and train, space trains and things, you might concentrate on the um, on the energy science. That's, so you've got that choice. And there are, very, but there, you have choices of efficiencies as well. So here, these recipes will take in all four of the types of insights and they'll produce a lot more significant data per insight than they would if you were only doing it from say just the blue ones but on the flip side over here you're taking in I can take in all four catalogs in order to produce the um, in order to produce the insights in the first place and that's more efficient than if I was just taking in the tier one catalogs so it's a balance between the two you're going to need you, you, it lets you choose what order which way which way which sort of science you want to prioritize and how you want to work through it which I think is quite nice then all of the science packs you're making, and there's lots of them, uh, get fed. Yeah, I feed. I fed all these round into my into my science area over here. So you see, you've got all these different belts bringing in all the different types of science packs. And then I decided it'd be fun to make a massive sushi belt for the science. So I've done that. I've got um, systems along here where we've got these these crates are designed to keep about 30, or at least at least a minimum of 30 of their science pack in them. So there's always some to pass out onto here, but there's also some buffer in case an unexpectedly large number come through the system from here because there's loads of space in this chest. There then they then all come out here then merge down and down and down onto these two belts which go up the side of my um my science facilities here and those will do the, and those will do the actual science for me and produce the uh, produce the data i'm looking for now this is all a bit unnecessary and a bit overkill because these science labs are so big and with the um with this many speed mod this much speed moduling and this much productivity moduling you could probably just stick the belts going straight in to the sides two so two of the sides of the um the science facility and do and, and, and do it that way rather than having a sushi belt but the sushi belt is pretty and it was fun to put together and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did it was it was a, a, an amusing idea um, so that's quite nice and if you want to know how it works there's videos about that if you, if you search for sushi on my channel you'll probably find it so that covers all of the those levels of science and then we get on to the real end game content which is the deep space science packs and over here we have it's the same sort of general idea in my in my setup. We've got the various different resources we need being brought in, and then we're starting to make the um, the deep space sciences. And they, to be honest, they didn't start off too badly. Um, we, I'm trying to remember actually because it was a little while ago. But yeah, it was mostly it wasn't too bad, but it did require this exotic new material called naquium, which I hadn't hadn't re wasn't really familiar with at this point. And naquium, you have to go off to somewhere else. You have to go off to a different. Um, you have to go off to an asteroid field somewhere outside your solar system in order to find it. So I chose Realm of Shadows because it was reasonably close, but had the resource, sort of resources I was looking for. And then out here you have, again, it's the same sort of general idea as normal. You, you, you mine up the Naquium. It requires sulfuric acid, a bit like mining uranium does in vanilla. <clears throat> but you can then chuck that onto belts. Uh, let's, let's have a bit of light. You're not supposed to have light here, but we'll have some anyway. Um, yeah, you put it onto belts. You then bring it off. You can, you, and, and I decided it was worth crushing it on in, on site because that because it's very sort of it's very voluminous. Relatively small amounts of it take up a lot of space, so it only stacks up to ten. But if you crush it, you can turn ten pieces of um, is it ten pieces. Sorry, four pieces of nacrotite into one piece of crushed nacrotite. So it stacks. So you can get four times as much in your spaceship. So you then need to load that into a spaceship, and that's the long-range ships I was talking about earlier. And you then take that off and you process it. But it requires a lot of processing. 
or rather it requires a lot of stuff in the processing. So over here we've got, um, this, this ship is bringing in the crushed nacrotite, so the, the same stuff as that you saw coming out of those crushing facilities. And then it goes in up here into these, into these machines, which wash it, mix it with um, vitalic acid, and then pass it, to turn, it into, turn it into the powder, and then it gets cooked into the ingots up here. So it's a fairly simple process, isn't it, you'd think. Except this particular step here takes in, for every two washed nacrotite, it takes four vitalic acid, and that only produces one naquium powder. Um, so you need an enormous quantity of this vitalic acid flowing in. So you can see I've got two mostly full belts flowing up here. And in order to make those two mostly full belts, I've got two completely full belts of vitamelange flowing up here and a lot of glass I think that's probably about a belt and a half and at least a little bit of uh, vulcanite as well so it's it's ridiculously expensive to make the vitalic acid in order to make the uh, the naquium so this is this is one of the hardest bits of the of the entire game I think was getting the processing facility up and running fast enough and producing just bringing over and ship carrying around and moving enough of the naquium now there is a teleport chest you can make which i haven't used but that's because it's not the it's not the um the logistics really that's a problem because the ships i've got can keep up with the uh, demand the problem is building up this processing system to, to um to produce the sheer sheer quantity you, you that you require and that's that's how that was that was difficult just getting getting all of the resources together here to in order to, in order to actually make the naquium but once you've made that naquium you can then start processing that to make the uh, the tier four space science. Uh, sorry, the the um, the deep space sciences. So you start making the tier ones. And you think, oh, that wasn't too bad. It doesn't require all that much naquium. Then you get onto the tier two, and it requires a lot more of it because you start making uh, naquium cubes down here, which each, each of which presumably requires six, six no sixteen naquium plates. Sorry, to make one naquium cube, as well as nanomaterials and particle streams and so on and so on, because of course it does. So yeah, you're making low all of this stuff down here just to make the tier twos. Then for tier threes, you have to you have to use archospheres, and I'm I'm not even going to try and explain archospheres in this video. If you want to know more about archospheres, um, go off and watch the um, go off and watch the tutorial I did on them because it's, I think that's quite a good video and it'll give you a, a much better explanation of what all this nonsense is about than I possibly can off the, off the top of my head right now. But that lets you make the tier three, and then eventually down here somewhere you've got the tier fours. And the tier fours require you to build a spaceship that can go off and fly at, at at least a certain speed, no, a certain speed, and and use up lots and lots of power. And the faster it goes, the more power it uses, but the more data it produces per power. So it's worth having a really quick ship for this. And that's just yet another thing to make it com more complicated. And then once you've done all of that, you then get onto the uh, the victory ship. Finally, this thing, and that's that's how you then win the the victory, but the uh, the spaceship victory part of the game. So that's <laughs> that's a sort of a, a, a quick run through of the uh, of the basic thrust of a game of space exploration. Now I say a quick run through that they, this took me about 525 at 530 hours to complete. So it's a big old game. Make sure you've got plenty of time um, available if you do if you do decide you want to play it. That said, if you do want to play it, I do very I very strongly recommend it. It's been an absolutely fantastic mod pack. I've really enjoyed it, and it's been it's almost the sort of the perfect continuation of Vanilla Factorio. So there's been a lot a lot of interest interesting stuff in there and I yeah I do very very highly recommend it. There are a few other things that are probably worth showing off as well so I mentioned br briefly the uh, the power consumption of so I've got in my uh, base around Kalidus orbit I've got all of these uh, solar panels and these are these are the um the the tier 2 tier 2 of the advanced solar panels so the third third tier of solar panels in general um, and these as you can see produce uh, they're producing 12 megawatts each that's a huge amount of power now a lot of that is because they're really really close to the sun which is why i've got this huge area of solar panels and unbuilt solar panels out here because this is in orbit around the sun so there's loads of power available here and then i'm using these beam emitter things here and these are powering all of my uh, planets. So if I look at, take a look at this one. This one's powering Norbis. Let's, look, let's try a different one. Okay, this one's powering Miokin. So if we have a, have a look at um, where it's going, we can see down here. This is firing that, that beam at this beam receiver. And that's producing lots and lots of heat, which is then being turned into steam in these, in these uh, heat exchangers. And then being turned into uh, electricity in these, in these uh, turbines. And uh, Miokin is an interesting planet because this doesn't have any, Miokin doesn't have any water of its own. So I'm having to ship water in as ice, which is actually no, I'm not. I, I was shipping it in as ice. Now I'm bringing it over. So I have a spaceship that lands somewhere. Oh yeah, so spaceship lands in this gap here. It unloads anti-meteorite defense uh, ammunition here. So these are my anti-meteorite guns to stop meteorites landing on the planet. And then it loads up with vulcanite here and stone, and it unloads water here. So the, sh the ship basically 
unloads, brings water out, and takes vulcanite back. So it's, uh, it's, it's doing both sort of both halves of the supply run. And this allows us to keep a supply of water on Miokin and keep everything tick ticking over here, even though we require keep, keep allowing this this power station here to keep trucking away nicely. I think I'm not going to go in and try and cover everything on, in, in space exploration because there's an enormous amount of stuff. But I will touch on uh, core mining because that's another interesting departure from vanilla. So you, you get core mining drills, which are these massive drills that you can place anywhere you like on your planet um, in 0.6. In 0, sorry, 0.5. In 0.6, you have to put them in very specific places, which is going to make things a little bit harder. <clears throat> but these dig up what we call core fragments, these grey things here. And we can then feed those through round here, put them into crushers like this, pulverizers, and they'll pulverize the core fragment into, well, as you can see, six iron, five copper, five coal, five stone, a, sm a two vulcanite, a small chance of some uranium, and some crude oil and some water. You take all that away, so we've got pipes here for the water, pipes for the oil, got belts for all of the other stuff. Pull that out. I've got a sorting system up here that puts it all onto, that goes from these mixed belts on the input to having sorted belts on the output and we're a little bit limited here by the copper so the copper belt is completely full so it causes a little bit it can cause a little bit of a backlog but never mind and I'm then able to feed that into all of these different stations down here to be taken off for all of the different resource gathering systems we need now this is great but the more of these you put down on a planet they still use the full amount of power which is 500 megawatts per drill so they're really sorry, sorry 50 megawatts per drill so they're really greedy power greedy and the more of them you put down on this on a single planet the less um core fragment the fewer core fragments they actually produce so i thought okay the obvious answer to that is to go out and put drill a few drills on every single planet around the around the system and then and then have the uh, have it all brought in by train by spaceship trains so I've got a spaceship that lands here with a couple of trains on it. The trains pull out uh, and go into go into the parking spaces down here. And then the other two trains are already here, which should already be emptied, will get onto the spaceship and the spaceship can leave again immediately. The train then pulls in over here it'll, and it'll unload its core fragments into these warehouses. And <clears throat> if, it's be, if it's come from a planet that produces other material, useful materials as well that I'm short of, then it can unload that, those into these, these warehouses. And they can then push the, um, all of that up here. So you can see in this case, we're feeding all of that, all this coal into the, into the coal warehouses over here. If we, if we brought up so extra stone, it can be put into the stone warehouses. If we brought extra copper, it can go into the copper warehouses. Simple. We just keep, it's just another way of bringing in more and more and more resources to, the, to this place. Then from here, the copper ore can be taken just over to here, where it gets dumped into all of these stations, into this station, passed out here. And this is another space exploration new thing. You, if you mix in uh, vulcanite into your in with your um, smelting process, then you get far more of whatever of the, the resource produced. So normally, the traditional recipe is, as I'm using over here, you take in. It doesn't show me. It doesn't show me the recipe. Uh, you take in. Let's see if we can find it in here. Yeah, you take in uh, one copper ore and you produce one copper plate. Whereas this one, you take in eight copper ore and one vulcanite block and you produce twelve copper plates. So you're turn, essentially turning one vulcanite block into an extra four copper plates. So you get quite an extra. You get quite a bit of a bonus out of that. So it's definitely definitely very worth using. And so over here in this smelting area, I've got one at the top, an area at the top here that's doing copper, and an area that's doing iron an area that's doing stone bricks, an area that's doing steel, more steel, and then glass down here, because these are all things you need enormous quantities of. Glass especially, I'm getting through a surprisingly large quantity of glass because of all of the vitalic acid that needs to be made. And every single vitalic acid you make goes into a little glass bottle, and so that and that, so it requires glass, to make, enormous quantities of glass. So I'm making all of that here. That then gets shipped up to the uh, the rocket port here, where we've got trains dropping off all the different resources. That then get loaded, like here's the glass, loaded into a rocket here. And then when Tulip needs some glass, it can, it can say, hey, I need some glass. This rocket will automatically launch over there, taking 500 stacks of it over. And then and then the system and then the system carries on working like that. This does, of course, require a lot of rocket fuel. So I've got a ship here that brings rocket fuel over from my oily planet and unloads it into the into the rocket into the rocketry system over here, and we can just provide that to the rockets. 
So yes, as I say, Space Exploration is a massive, massive mod pack. I strongly recommend it, but do make sure you've got plenty of time available to, to play through it. Or if you want to get a, a feel for it, have a watch through some of my uh, some of my videos. That I do. I've been tending to do about a half hour summary each, uh, once a week to uh, to give an idea of what I've been up to that week and to give an impression of how the how, how the game is going, what I've been up to, what's been going on, and, uh, and without you having to watch the entire three or four hour stream, um, depending on what what, what interests you. So there'll be more stuff to come in the future. Um, as I say, we're going to start um, Factorio Space Exploration 0.6 with Crastorio 2 um, in in a couple of weeks. Well, no, in a, by the time you see this video, it'll probably be about tomorrow, I think. So uh, please come along to the, the stream for that, and there'll be the summary videos coming out for that one as well. There's also going to be a um, Dyson Sphere program video uh, series kicking off. That's going to be streamed on Wednesdays and the videos at the weekend as well. Um, and there's GTA videos and tutorials and other things coming out on the channel as well. So there's lots and lots of content to see, lots and lots to watch. I, I strongly recommend you check it all out. And uh, please make sure you subscribe to the channel. And I look forward to seeing you in the next videos. Thanks for watching.